Welcome, Tara. You're the VP of Sales at Five Drive, uh, Jean Christophe. Welcome to you as well. You're the Chief Commercial Officer at Travel Spark, and uh, the Travel Park, uh, and you are going to be talking about that critical point. We need to sell to be building up, to be scaling up. Uh, when you launch your company, you may find yourself uh, in a position where most of the staff is new at sale at the very, very beginning when you're a startup. So the risk of a fatal error when it comes to customer relationship uh, is very high. Uh, how is it possible to prevent it? How do you not make too many mistakes at the very beginning of the process? Tara. Yeah, so I think um, one of the first things I talk about is hiring people that have a track record is always going to be helpful. Um, I like to keep my staff with, I would say, between 20 and 30% of what I would call a project, meaning that they've never done that role before. It may be their first time, and that's fine, but you don't want your whole staff of that. So I think that's one thing. The second thing is um, you need to figure out across the whole company, because I think this is a, a big part, not just in sales, but in every department, you want to make sure that everybody has one common goal. Right, so for us at Pipe Drive, it's what is everything that we do has got to go back to making our, our customers successful in their job. And then I think the third thing is accountability. Uh, uh, Pipe Drive is, uh, is, is developing cloud based uh, uh, sales software. So I think you've gonna be monitor, monitor, uh, you have been monitoring pretty precisely the needs of your customers and maybe the failures of your customer when it comes to sales management. What did you observe? What did, you, what did you monitor? Yeah, I think the number one thing that we found within our industry, which is a sales CRM tool, is, um, and, and JC and I were just talking about this backstage, is uh, it's getting your reps to use it. <laughs> it's the number one thing, right? The, uh, the information is only as good as what's entered. And so it was really about making sure that we created a tool that the customers wanted to use, which was our sales reps. And so that is our number one um, you know, area that we always focus on, is making sure that, that the customers use it and that the sales reps want to use it. And what about you, uh, Jean-Christophe? What is your point of view about the, the, the fatal errors, the mistakes that need to be avoided at the very beginning of a startup story? Uh, like the, the biggest mistake I've seen a lot of startups doing is you have the founder, he's selling, and he's goddamn good at it because that's his company. He has the charisma, he knows the product really well, and then he decides to recruit one guy, and it doesn't work. Yes. And then you don't know if the problem is the person or the process. So if I had like one advice, never, ever, ever hire one salesperson. Always hire two. Because then you have a small chance that first of all, one will work, and two, you know if it is the people or the process. So that's fatal mistake number one. And how do you find the right person? How do you make sure they, uh, they fit your project? Because at the very beginning, when you're a startup, the founder has her or his vision. He's persuaded that he's going to be changing the world. And now you need to get that into process. And you need to find the right people to transfer, transform the vision in a very operational uh, plan. How do you find those kind of person? So I think th there are two steps. The first one is you probably have the first five salespeople where you don't really need a manager. And what you need more than anything is grit. Like the early days of a startup are really, really hard. I've done that now four times, and it doesn't get easier. It's still very hard. Um, then as you get bigger, then that's when you bring sales manager, VP sales, chief commercial who have seen it, done it. But the beginning, good, young people with grit, that will do the trick. And for you, Tara, who is, what is the right profile when it comes to the first sales maker in the company? Yeah, one of the things that I've done in a lot of companies that um, I've worked with in the sales team is I create an actual profile of what our top reps do. So like JC was saying, start with you know a couple. Notice what characteristics and skills they have that are in common. I remember one company it was that they sold financial services in the past. So when I created a scorecard and while I was interviewing people, I had characteristics and questions that we asked to uncover whether or not they had these skills maybe a, a history um, and some um, characteristics. So if we have a weighted scorecard, and that way you just take the emotion out of hiring. 
Sales uh, uh, and the sales process is no magic, it's not hard science, it's a very operational, very pragmatic process where you have to learn from your mistakes and you have to be doing mistakes. Have you got some kinds of positive mistakes you've been, you, you, you have been doing, or people in your company have been doing, and from which you learned a lot, actually? Tara? Yeah, I, I think... Um I try not to call it, if it's the first time that it's a mistake, I like to call them a learner. So you just learn from them. I think if it happens again, then it's a mistake. <laughs> um, so I love having learners because that's how you get better. Um, I think a common learner in our industry, and you can help me if you believe this, but a lot of people will say, uh, we got to look at the number and you have to hit this number. And so they'll say, okay, this many salespeople will bring in this much revenue to hit that number. And I think that you can actually, um, I'm pretty known in my industry to say, well, hold on, I'm not going to add anybody quite yet. I'm going to make sure that I optimize it first before I add heads. And that was because of a learner I had early on in my career. I just tried to throw heads at the, at the number instead of efficiency and processes. And uh, at Travel, uh, Travel Park, uh, Jean-Christophe, a few mistakes that actually uh, uh, went on positively. Yeah, we, we, we did a lot of them. Um, but I mean, we also did some good stuff. Uh, but the, the key thing that we did was we did them on purpose. Uh, we didn't know there would be mistake, but we knew exactly what we wanted to do, what we wanted to experiment, and what was success or failure. So when we launch something, we don't blame the people, we blame um, our own experiment. And that's the big difference is if you know where you are going, then you know if it's right or wrong. Like how many times you end up with something, you're like, eh, is it good, is it not? No, that's the worst feeling. You should know if it's good or not. Uh, we've got a very how-to question coming from the audience. What are now the main challenges of the sales, term, uh, of the sales team at P Travel Park? Um, so there are a few of them, but I mean, to give you some context, like two years ago, there was two salespeople. Now there is almost a hundred. So how to scale the team really fast without losing accountability and keeping the culture is really hard. How to divide territory is really hard. Um, so we are kind of a scale-up kind of phase where now our challenge are more around team organization, team motivation, and territory management. And the, the question isn't for you, uh, Tara, but maybe we, it's interesting to know the main challenges of the sales teams at the PyDrive at the moment. Yeah, definitely. So we're um, actually in a transition where you know, we've been around for almost 10 years and we've got over 85,000 customers around the world and we pretty much have done it without sales. So sales is actually a very new um, philosophy at Pipedrive because it's all been an inbound machine. A lot of companies we were talking about have done a great job with this, Shopify, Zendesk. And so we're in that transition of trying to understand where are you making the right value at that and then how do you scale that? To be highly efficient at selling, to be uh, delivering, you need, first of all, to know your customer. Uh, maybe you've got uh, a, a few uh, CRM 101 to share with us. Obviously, you're very, <laughs> you're very state of the art in, the, in that field at, uh, uh, at Pipedrive. How could you give us a few advice, Tara, in, in this field? CRM 101, know your customer, the basic facts. Yeah, definitely. Again, I'm going to go back to, I think the number one thing is use a tool, find a CRM tool that your reps will use. It can't be a tool for uh, the manager, the CFO, the CEO. It's got to be a tool that is useful for your reps. If you're paying, it's the most expensive tool. It's the most important tool as a salesperson. Make sure your, your team wants to use it and that is going to ensure success. So one of the things that I really loved about Pipedrive and why I joined the company is because they can continually focus on how can we make sure that we're going to make your number, whatever you have to hit, certain? We know it's a very activity based. So you want to find a tool that has, you know, automations, AI is a big buzzword I, I feel like right now. And, and, you, and you want it in sales. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And you want to do something that's going to ensure that if you do X, you will get Y from it. Uh, uh, obviously, knowing your customer is very, is, is very, is a cri critical point for you uh, in your business, which is travel, uh, uh, travel management. A few uh, uh, advices to share with us, a few best practices to share with us, Jean Christophe. Yeah, I mean, just a quick story. When when I joined the company two years ago, one of the the company was focused on number of customer, which in our business is a total, complete vanity metrics. It really doesn't matter. Um, and so the first thing that's really important um, at 
as a sales leader or commercial leader is know your customer and follow the money. Like, where are you actually making money? Don't follow active user or number of customers unless this is actually making money. Um, and sometimes this small shift alone can make a massive difference in efficiency. And if you find that you don't, you're not making enough money, what do you do? Cut the offer? Refurbish it? Yeah, I mean, if you are not making enough money from the market segment, then you need to figure out why. And you might need to move to another market segment um, because it's not going to get any better by miracle. Like, it's, if you are not making good money now, it's not going to get any better. And small incremental change in the sales process, that's not going to cut it. And sales management is not only, and sales improvement is not only about getting new customers, it's about keeping them. It's also a matter of execution of post, if, you, if I may call it that way, post sales management. How do you cope with it? How do you improve it? Tara? Yeah, I actually want to just take a step back from that point, because I think this is a point that a lot of startups and entrepreneurs, a mistake that they make which is whenever you'll ask, well, how are you growing? Everyone wants to talk about the top of the funnel, the top of the line, the money coming in, the new revenue. And really what I hope that we can change as an organization of entrepreneurs is what's your bottom line? How is the company growing, not your new revenue coming in? Because customers are very, very important. Once they're your customer, you can't just Put them, put them aside. So what, what I do, a very common, I did this at Pipedrive, when I, as soon as I came in, we had a customer success team. They did one thing. They would call customers every once in a while, how you doing, you know, whatever. So we stopped doing that. Uh, I did this actually at WebEx Communications as well uh, back in early 1999 or 2000, is we started an implementation team. So what we did is I have customer success into two teams. One, that will, that will keep the customer for the first 90 to 100 days. Those critical times where, you know, you want to train and implement them, get them using your tool, happy, and then you can go a little bit more on the cruise control. But it's really imperative to get that, that implementation phase right. Two teams, in fact. Jean-Christophe, how do you deal with it? Yeah, I mean, if, if just as a, you know, as a best practice, if you look at every single SaaS company that has IPO, they are very different. They have one thing all in common, their retention is superior to their churn. They make more money from expansion than what they lose. That's the secret. So if you get that right, then everything is okay. As long as you don't get that right, it's going to be painful. You're going to have to acquire a customer. It's going to be like a, a, a barrel with a, with a hole at the bottom. It's going to be really hard. So focus a lot on retention. Focus a lot on retention revenue. Thanks to Slido, we've got another uh, very interesting question from, coming from the audience. How much should we take into consideration the company's ego while negotiating with clients, with clients about specific products? How do you cope with this? That's a very interesting point. Tara? I think it's a good point. I, um, I know that a lot of companies, especially when you're starting out, will have to make some deals that maybe are financially a little bit on the negative side. Um, but I do believe that if you continue to discount constantly, uh, you'll be known in the market to do that, and then it devalues your product. So I'm not a big believer in discounting. I actually came into Pipe Drive and I said no more discounting, um, and then I just have to approve them because you're, you know, get your pricing right ahead of time. If your pricing right originally, then you don't have to discount heavily. Jean Christophe. Yep, and probably my. Slight tweak to what Tara just said is, if you want to do that, do it structurally. Plan it. If you say, I'm going to allow my salespeople to give up to 20% and then they need to ask for permission, then structure it. Don't leave it up to them. Um, that's probably the key. Jean-Rémy is asking us a very interesting question. He's actually the CEO sales person of the company. Where do I find these first amazing sales uh, people that I am looking for? And he, ha he adds, can an unexperienced sales make it in B2B? Jean-Christophe. So, I think, first of all, just look here. There might be amazing people around here. Um, so be networking at the very yeah, end of the session. Yeah, be networking at this type of event. And yeah, an, ex an unexperienced salesperson can make it really well in B2B. Like, I, I started, I knew nothing about B2B. You just need the attitude. You need somebody with a grit, a right mind, and then you can teach them everything else. T with a little caveat, unless your product is incredibly technically difficult. 
Okay, you need that. That's a good point. Sarah. I would also say, I think that there are a few of those characteristics and skills that are very common to be successful in sales. One of them is persistence. And the other one is that they're just gonna be proactive. You don't want someone, you know, when you're interviewing them, try to find people that, I will always say, hey, you know, if, I don't, if you don't hear back from me by Wednesday, give me a call. See if they call you back. There's little things you can do to see are they persistent because that's a number one very common trait I think you have to have to be successful in sales. And if I may, like one of the tricks I use sometimes for junior, because you have junior that are right out of university and people are like, yeah, but how do you know if they are persistent? How do you know if they have grit? Look at what they have done during their study. You will see that every single one of them that are great, they have done something. They created a company, they launched a project, they did an internship. You can see that from very early on, even with junior profile. But College athletes too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Always good sales reps. Uh, and since we re really uh, are in real life, what do you do if your sales team or sales rep is not perform performing well? Tara? So I think that... Let uh, them go, but have the <laughs> others. Fire them. No, um, no, really. I think there's got to be a couple of things. So I always have a process. Well, you'll know. It's not a big surprise if you're going to have a performance improvement plan. So for us, it's something like, and it's got to be different for everybody, but you know, if you're not hitting your metrics by X amount of time, period, I don't care who you are, you know, you're going to get an improvement plan and you'll have X amount of time to make these changes. Otherwise, you exit the company. Okay. But just make it so there's no emotion and you do the same thing with every single rep. You seem to agree, Jean-Christophe. Absolutely. And same story. Is it the people or is it the process? That's why you always need two people doing the same job. If it is your entire sales team not doing well, eh, eh, maybe have a think about your market segmentation and your process because that might just not be the people. That's very accurate. Thank you. Uh, when it comes, uh, and to get back maybe to, to, uh, to the back office, when it comes to sales right now, datas are all over the place. It's the talk of the town. How do you cope with it? How do you take advantage of it to be always more accurate when it comes to your, to, to your sales, to your offer? Jean-Christophe. So, for, at least for most tech companies, the key thing is CRM are great and you need them, but try to feed information to your CRM that are relevant. So, for example, in our case, we are in business travel. We feed the number of trips a company has done, how much money they have spent, because you need context. Um, so, try to make whatever CRM you use, make it the single source of truth. There is nothing worse for salespeople than having to jump around. So feed everything into one place and make your CRM this one place. And then choose the best CRM. Tara, obviously you're very state of the art when it comes to data, uh, being, uh, being in, a, in a company that makes uh, sales softwares. A few advices to share with us. Yeah, I think data is the number one thing. I think uh, sales is one of those interesting departments that is definitely left brain and right brain, right? There's a science and, and an art to it. And so I think you've got to have good data. You're, you may not have enough data. You may not have all the data, but just do something that's directionally correct. It doesn't have to be perfect in the beginning, especially. Um, and then again, you know, making sure that you have a tool that has great open APIs. You can get a lot of other um, you know, tools that will work really well with it. There is another question I like here because obviously sales and sales management is always a work in progress. How often do you need to redesign, maybe before redesigning it, to evaluate your sales process? How do you cope with it, Tara? So I think this is, a de this is not a destination. This is a constant journey. You will always be redefining and fine-tuning. Have you got processes? Have you got rituals about it? Yeah? Yeah, you do have to give some time to have them to see if they work. And so I think it's really important to understand where in the process there are, I call them dark ages, like spots where people are having problems. And then what you do to try to get ahead of them, you understand why are you having that gap in the process? And then you identify maybe one or two of those things and then you fix those one or two things earlier on in the process. Jean-Christophe, I think you're doing it on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, you do it on a day-to-day -day basis, and what happens is nobody likes change, not even salespeople. Even in startups? I'm even really disappointed. No, <laughs> even in startups. That's the funny part is people join startup because they want change, but then you change their sales process and they actually don't like it. So one of the tricks I've learned among the, along the way is to tell the team at every single quarterly review that they are expecting the sales process to change. So it's, 
actually, when it doesn't change, they are actually surprised um, because you really want to have this kind of culture of it's going to change, it's going to change, and have as little resistance as possible. Tara, Just one yeah. more point on that. I think that it's a really important piece. So, you know, I really believe that the sales rep at the end of the day is your heart and soul of the company. And so I think that if you're able to have them part of the decision and have it be a collaborative decision. So in, in a culture that we try to create is bring a problem and what you believe the solution should be. And then you can gather those and make them feel like they're part of the, the new process change so that when it happens, they really feel bought in that they want the change. Uh, I'm getting back to data and, and, and their impact. Now, the holy grail when it comes to sales in f trying and make tailor-made offers and constantly involving tailor-made uh, customer relationship management. Is it possible? Is it just a dream? How do you try to get closer to it in your companies? Tara. Yeah, I think that the number one thing is you have to constantly be getting better, uh, it, whether it's your process or your people, right? So the quality of, there's some great tools out there that um, that can, you know, control phone calls, score them nowadays, um, constantly, you know, coaching. There's no professional sports person out there that doesn't do drills and basic drills every day, and I think that's the same thing for sales. Jean-Christophe, same thing? Same yeah, kind of thing? Same thing. Uh, yeah, nothing else to add on this one. Just keep it... Keep it relevant to whoever you're talking to. Another how-to question. Do you use KPI to me measure the performance of sales reps? Obviously, you do, but how do you do it? Tara. Yeah, I think the number one thing is, at the end of the day, you want to have one thing, and that's their quota, their revenue number. Don't, don't make your quota too complicated, okay? Don't have it be, you have to have this revenue plus this plus that. Just have it be a straight revenue number. But what will happen is, is when they're not hitting that number, that's when you look at your KPIs. That's when you have them published. You have everybody them updated constantly. You let everyone see everything everybody else's, that creates a very competitive and fun environment as well. But those are constant, those are your first indicators if they're not hitting their number. Jean-Christophe? I'm not really sure I will let everybody see all the KPI, but that's, uh, that's a different <laughs> topic. Um, but yeah, they do need to know their KPI and keep it simple. Like there is one KPI, two KPI max, like otherwise the more KPI you have, the more people lose focus. And I'm taking that very last question because obviously sales management is also a very human resources process. People need to, get, to be motivated and in, when it comes to sales to be incentivized. Would you, give, uh, would you go with capped or uncapped bonus? How do you incentivize? Oh, that's I like that's those smiles. Please. You've got things to share please, with us, people. Please, never, to hear never, never cap an incentive. Never. <laughs> never. never. Please never cap it. The if bigger, have, the better. If you have capped an incentive, if you feel you are giving them too much money, that means that either your plan is not good, okay, maybe, or actually they are awesome. They are just really good people. Don't cap it. It's so, so depressing. Yeah, dream big, Tara. Never cap. And what I would also say is make sure that they're, that whatever it is, it's driving the right behavior, right? You want them to be doing the right activities for that. Thank you. Thank to both of you for this very, 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 very accurate, very concrete session. A big round of applause for our speakers.